charge when you're like 100 kilometers away from home and you're hoping to get to your friend's house so you can plug in and charge up again, or you're in the middle of your presentation and we've got an unknown amount of battery left um, and you don't want it to go flat. You want these low cells not to go flat when you discharge if they go flat. Um, basically, this graph, turn it upside down, it will look pretty similar in discharge, uh, slightly different shape, but basically one cell will go flat first and if you don't stop, that cell gets destroyed. Um, so you have to get them all balanced so that they don't, you don't lose one cell and another cell and then another cell and suddenly you've got only half of your battery if you don't start a fire, which is what will happen with your laptop. Um, so, hey, that works. Okay, don't use page up and page down, use the mouse. And the scrolly thing at the bottom. Excellent. Um, so, lead acid batteries. Um, I think I forgot to put. What happened there? Okay. I don't know, this crazy open office thing. Um, lead acid battery has gone horribly wrong that picture. Anyway, this is four lead acid batteries. Uh, they're wired in series. Um, we'll assume they're 12 volts, so that's they're probably out of an alarm or something. I found it on the internet. You can't read the URL. Sorry. Um, so six fours, 24 cells in series. And I'm running out of time. Basically, a lead acid battery is a water-based electrolyte. So when you add more electrons, you crack the water and you make hydrogen and oxygen. In your car battery, that water is usually lost and you add more. In a sealed battery, there's a catalyst which turns it back into water. And so the battery's happy. And the only problem is that the seals and the vents, because if something goes horribly wrong, it'll explode because you've got too much pressure inside, so you have to have a vent. They leak. And so you lose the hydrogen and oxygen if you keep the battery at high voltage which is what your alarm or your UPS will do because it's really easy and that's why your battery only lasts a couple of years in your alarm. And nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride, basically the same, they use nickel instead of lead, um, but it's another water-based electrolyte and so it's the same. Uh, you can overcharge them slowly and the catalyst will take care of things except for the piece a little bit and the cell goes dry. Um, Lancing cells in two pounds, uh, in two pounds is crazy. So lithium, lithium's more interesting because you can fit more energy into the same weight. You can drive further battery and the laptop lasts longer. But the electrolyte is not water, it's a complex organic molecule. And if you shove more electrons in, then it starts to break down. You get nasty chemicals inside the battery and it destroys it from the inside. So you have to be more careful. Um, worse, some lithium chemistries, and they're not all the same, but some lithium chemistries will catch fire or otherwise cause chaos if you overcharge them. The lead acid battery just gets sick. If you do terrible things to it, a lithium battery can literally catch fire and throw your laptop across the room. So battery management system anti patterns I didn't have a picture, so I made a really big thing. Um, no battery management system. That is probably the easiest anti-pattern. This is a friend of mine's car. Um, it's got a whole lot of Thunder Sky lithium cells in it and they're just joined together by those straps. There's no battery management system. Um, it's really simple. It looks great. It won't work for very long unless you're meticulous about managing it manually. Basically you become the battery management system. You have to measure the voltages of all the cells. When you come towards the end of charge, you have to be careful that none of them are going over. Um, this car did have an accident where it got over discharged. It destroyed two cells. Um, don't worry, he did put a battery management system on. This is just a photo before he did it, um, which was like 10 minutes later. But it's the only one I could find. So. Bypass circuit. My slides are out of order. How did that happen? So, 
I made this. Um, it's a white LED and a transistor on top of a cell. Uh, when the voltage goes high, the transistor turns on. Uh, it's great, except that you don't know that there's anything wrong until it gets really bad. Um, there's also the possibility that it will go into thermal runaway and catch fire, um, but you sort of have to abuse it. I wouldn't use that. So a single error flag, this is the same car with its battery management system installed, those black cables between the circuit boards. Uh, when something goes wrong, the black cable, uh, two wires in it get joined together by an optocoupler. Uh, and if you're lucky, you notice and go, ooh, there's something wrong, and you go and fix it. But you don't know which cell's wrong, and if any of these little circuits don't work, then you don't know that anything's going wrong. So it tells you something is going wrong, but if it says it's all good, it might not be. So, I don't really like that either, um, because one day you lose a cell and you don't know why, and you've got no history, and maybe that could work. Fail safe monitoring. Basically, you don't want failure modes that cause problems. Um, the way that I've implemented that is to have a master which measures, oh my god, there's five minutes left. Um, basically, you have something that watches every cell and says, are you okay? And if you don't get a reply, you assume it's not okay. Uh, and that's the circuit that does it. Um, it was designed by a guy in the States. That's the circuit diagram. It's quite complicated. Um, a guy called Bob Simpson. The schematics for this are on SourceForge. Um, I would have done a few things differently. If we go back here. It's got lots of jumpers. It's got five CPUs, one for each cell. They're picked CPUs. Um, they're exciting to program. Who wants to hear about microcontroller programming? I think you're going to have to talk to me later. Um, I'm a Java programmer. I learned lots of stuff. It was exciting. Uh, performance. So this is my battery charger. It's taking 10 amps out of the mains. It's putting 40 amps into the battery. Uh, it's only a little battery. And that is the voltage on the oscilloscope. It's going up and down because the charger puts in big pulses of current. If you try and measure that at a random position, you get this massive swag of noise. You need a way to get rid of that, which also lets you read the voltage quickly. You have to wait for several of those cycles to know what the average value is. That takes time. You can't optimize that away because it's actually there. Um, I see what that does. So if you scroll in this thing with the scrolly mouse thing, it scrolls these. That's what's going on. That's insane. So anyway, that's my car. It's going to be the open day. Um, hopefully, I've convinced you that you need a battery management system which records everything. Okay, so we've still got just a couple of things that we want to show you. Let's go. We'll get it. Technology, eh? Good to have it. Okay, we like that slide, don't we? Um, so thank you, Tom. That's BMS, is, as you can see, very important. So quickly, okay, Tom. Oh. So version one, this is where we're at. We have a basic inverter with basic safety. We have the battery management system, which is independent. So we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip skip over these. So version two and version three, we've got plans. Check out the slides online. I'm sure they'll be online later. Um, there's one more thing I want to talk about just before we finish up and have questions. So into the future, we're looking at the same infrastructure, the solar network, the battery management system, the inverters, leads to another massive opportunity. Same hardware, different software. All it is is software and a little bit of hardware. Um, this is actually a um, AC propulsion. I have a patent on this. Um, it's, it's how to turn, turn your inverter and your motor into a, into a charger with basically some switches um, and a plug. 
um, really, really quite a clever idea because it saves a whole lot of money. You don't have to buy a charger. Um, there is, anyway, the point is there's a better way of doing this. Um, it doesn't violate the patent and we'll be publishing that soon. Um, they probably won't appreciate that, but that's, <laughs> that's just the facts. Um, and that, that means you can build a, a charger with just some software and some switches, but not violating the patent. Um, and what that leads to is an opportunity. So this is the big picture. You've got the solar network node at the top. You've got down here, you've got your electric vehicle, which is what Tom and I have spoken about. Within that same thing, just with a bit of software, you can turn that into a, a charger so that it can receive power from the grid. It can also go the other way and feed power into the grid. So you actually have this storage device. Um, it's called vehicle to grid. It's not uncommon. It's been done a lot out there. But when you combine that with an open source distributed grid of power generation and open source storage of energy, um, all of a sudden you've got distributed generation. Um, and if you look at that, that opens up all sorts of opportunities. So I'll leave it there. Um, this is the future. Um, come and help us. We're going to be at the open day. Come and see us. Thomas Mini, the Saker. You'll be able to see it in, in real life. A quick comment I wanted to, yes. to say that the, the reason the open source is very important yes. is, like for example, the battery management system will be unique perhaps for different vehicles. Yes. And the, you look at the batteries, you're running low, how, or overheating or slightly over voltage, you want the motor controller to respond to that in your way. Correct. And that's why the open code is needed is because each car is individual and yes. if you don't have access yep. to how the motor controller will work, in your, that's the reason you need that open yep. source, and to be able to reach in there and tweak yep. the little part you want. Exactly. And that's a real important issue that I didn't, you didn't really mention. That's important, the, the key of that. Yeah, and, and I guess 100% Bill, um, Bill Dubay, he's the owner of the killer cycle, the world's fastest electric drag, drag bike, which is in Papa tomorrow, for four days. So <laughs> go and see that. But yeah, being open source guys, uh, yeah, awesome. Oh, it's that way, yeah. Have you got any um, safety code to stop um, instantaneous um, selection from forward to reverse and vice versa? And yes, stop? correct. We have. That, that's interlocks on, mate. Yep. <laughs> that was the first code we wrote. <laughs> yeah, what? 100%, which is why Microsoft inside, I want to be able to look at the code. I want people like you asking those questions and saying, hey, you've done this wrong, or that's not right, fix it. You know, thousands of people out there looking at your code is going to be way better than 10 programmers being paid $100,000 a year. Yeah. No questions. Um, I just had a question about your last chart about the future. Yep. Um, as far as feeding the power back into the grid yep. and creating these open source yes. uh, grids, what what is the current state of that in New Zealand as far as, you know, what does it take? Is, yep. it, is it very expensive? You what can, is the obligation of the power companies? Yep. You know, do they yep. give you credit for it? Or, yep, you, you know, can already do that. So there's some companies that are already giving you one for one. Um, how long that lasts for, I'm not sure. And whether it's going to be into the future, whether it's going to get better, I don't know. Um, but quite often, well, in every case, the, the technology is there to some degree. This, this is my opinion, I guess, to, to serve the business models that are already, you know, the status quo to some degree. Doing this breaks open that mold. So all of a sudden, what's possible isn't limited by a business plan or a business model. It's, li it's limited by the technology and what's possible. Do you know which companies do take the power? Um, I believe, yeah, there's a number of them. I know Meridian does one for one. Um, yeah. This, um, um, this people agree. So you wouldn't do it if it's one for one. Why would you buy? Of what hour for 20 cents, throw a little bit of it away as you charge your battery, and then throw a little bit of it away as you give it back and get 20 cents. You said you don't get 20 cents because you threw some of it away. You can only do this if you buy cheap at night and sell expensive during the afternoon when all the air conditions are on. Um, you could have used a feed in power by taking electricity and then feeding it back in, and indeed, um, I've heard of someone who has solar panels and lights. So in other words, they 
we charged a certain amount for consuming electricity and they got more for selling it back. So they, they used electricity to generate electricity and made money. <laughs> Not in New Zealand though, but they don't have those tariffs in New Zealand. Yeah. What's your um, overall cost for like components and yep. Well, yeah, so that's something that I was meaning to speak to and didn't. So when you do this in open source, all of a sudden you don't have you know, intellectual property and venture capital to pay back. So the, the actual cost of manufacturing and getting the products out there is just that. It's the service of creating the product, the physical product, and how much you, know, you need to mark up to do that so you can not go, go bust. Um, so that the costs are significantly under other commercial entities out there producing products. Um, and it makes business, other business ventures uh, realistic. So I haven't answered your question directly, and that's because there's a number of answers. It depends on the power module you're using. Um, if you're using the top end stuff, um, if you're buying them in one-off quantities, those power modules are about $6,000. If you're buying them in volume, that can reduce by up to 50%. Um, that's 200 kilowatts. You don't want one of those if we're going to the shopping. Yeah. <laughs> So, no, we're, we're working on that to fix one of the key. <laughs> right, yeah. Thank you. There, there is an electric DeLorean in, um, in the States, and yeah, he makes, makes a lot of pay out of it. So. <laughs> right. Thank you, everyone. We're out of time. Uh, just looking for thank you, our presenters. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone wants to ask questions with Tom and I, we'll, we'll be hanging around all believe even. So you're welcome. Right. Thank you very much.